Tighten a mainspring, and it has to unwind when you start to release the tension. The barrel then transfers that energy to the watch's various gears through an array of interlocking cogs built into each of them, eventually moving the balance wheel. The escapement mechanism keeps the balance wheel vibrating and allows the watch's gears to advance by a set amount with each swing. Thus, the balance wheel oscillates back and forth with each motion taking precisely the same amount of time. Things work the way they do because they have to. Water flows downhill. Push a swing, it returns. If everything is in the right place, then the world will always move exactly how we expect it to, because it can't not do that. But what if you had the ability to reach into our universe and rearrange the various cogs and wheels of existence? Maybe even add new ones, stop certain gears, or start others early? What if you could control the very mainspring, escapement mechanism, and balance wheel of reality? Then you just might be one of the most powerful entities in all of creation. Hello, I'm Tyler, this is the Imaginary Axis, and one of the most popular pastimes on this channel involves exploring exactly how powerful certain comic book characters are. Mathematically, scientifically. And I'm not gonna lie, it can get a little overwhelming. I often feel like there's a certain expectation to outdo myself, and each time I tackle a video like this, I purposefully try to find a character who makes the last character look unimpressive by comparison. Which, of course, gets harder and harder. But recently, there's been a newcomer in the DC Universe who keeps getting hyped up as one of the greatest threats in all of comic book history. And ever since the last big multiverse-shattering event, he's been sitting in the background, moving some of our favorite heroes and villains around like chess pieces. There's this mysterious air of dread around him and his unclear motivations as he's repeatedly painted as a force beyond the Justice League, beyond Darkseid, and even beyond this guy, who is actually pulling different versions of Superman from every reality in the multiverse just to drain their powers into himself out of the hopes he would eventually be able to face off against this unstoppable invader from outside of everything. The verdict? Well, Superman stopped him. But even if he had succeeded in draining every single one of them, he still wouldn't have stood a chance against this impending doom. Now, none of the characters really know who this guy is, and he's done his best to stay a looming, shadowy figure. But most of us who have been paying attention are pretty sure that the DC multiverse is encountering Dr. Manhattan. If you've never heard that name before, don't worry. I'd say you have to be a solid three layers deep in the comic book fandom to really understand him, despite his being a lead character in the best-selling graphic novel of all time. But the point is, there's been a lot of discussion lately, both in-universe and out, about exactly how powerful he really is. It's unclear. I think I might have come to something of a definite conclusion after really looking into him, but it's complicated, so I'm going to politely ask everyone to bear with me as I take some time to talk about what Dr. Manhattan is, where his powers come from, and what that says about his overall abilities. I think you'll be pleasantly satisfied with the answer. But first things first, you have to ask if you find yourself attractive. The answer is yes. As a matter of fact, you find everything attractive because of gravity. Even if you're sitting on the exact opposite side of the Earth from me right now, provided you have average weight, I'm attracting you with roughly this much force. But close up, it's a lot stronger. And your molecules are all so attracted to each other that they're holding you together like some of the universe's best brand of duct tape. But gravity isn't the only thing doing the job. The electromagnetic force responsible for pulling positives and negatives together keeps your molecules bonded and stops electrons from flying off of your body. The strong nuclear force fights against electromagnetism's repulsive properties and keeps your nuclei together. And the weak nuclear force stabilizes your atoms through radioactive decay. Together, these four fundamental forces can explain every interaction in the universe, as far as we know. And they're what keeps you... you. Of course, depending on your exact shape and size, everyone's personal field of attraction energy is a little different, but Tyler, I can hear you typing. What does any of this have to do with Dr. Manhattan? Well, a lot, actually. You see, Dr. Manhattan wasn't always a glowing blue muscle man who likes to feel the breeze between his knees and you can't stop him. There was actually a time back in 1959 when the good doctor was just... a regular doctor. Named John Osterman. Who was working on nuclear research with the United States government at the height of their Cold War with the Soviet Union. And as is typical when researching how to rip atoms apart and blow up your enemies, Dr. Osterman's lab had a particular interest in manipulating the four fundamental forces of nature. Specifically, they'd built something called an intrinsic field subtractor, which would sort of delete all the forces holding an object together so the scientists could take notes on the different effects this had. And Dr. Osterman was unlucky enough to accidentally get himself trapped in one of their testing chambers right before the next scheduled experiment. 
he was annihilated. It's actually important everybody understand exactly what's going on here. If you had the four fundamental forces ripped from your body, your intrinsic field just deleted, you wouldn't die. You wouldn't even be destroyed. Oh no, you would be literally unmade. The things that hold together, the things that hold together your atoms would be gone. You are wiped from the face of the universe. There's nothing to bury. There isn't even a shadow or a smoldering pile of ash. You are nothing. Which is why the first thing Dr. Manhattan ever did would automatically set him up as the most powerful thing in the history of humanity. He came back. Oh sure, it took a few months. He had to find all the right pieces and slowly learn how to control them, but Dr. Osterman was a watchmaker before he was a physicist. He knew he could put himself back together, he just had to make sure all the right pieces were in the right places. This is the core of what Dr. Manhattan does. He's a matter manipulator, a reality bender. He takes the tiniest parts of the universe, the cogs and gears required to make things work, and he puts them where he wants them. Suddenly he can crush tanks, construct castles, and he only gets better at it over time. Need proof? Well, that same accident that ripped his atoms apart the first time was tried on him again a few years later, and the body that originally took him months to create was put back together in a matter of seconds. In the original Watchmen story, it was suggested that he couldn't fully stop a nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. But lately, he's been seen manipulating infinite timelines, threatening all of existence, and even destroying this character, who we know is powerful enough to single-handedly defeat seven monsters who could all easily destroy the multiverse. In one shot! See, this is part of what makes gauging Dr. Manhattan's power so hard. He's not like most muscly heroes who could theoretically only take so much force before they collapse. He controls the force. He can lift and punch and shoot and fly as hard and fast as he wants. So our real questions are, how much force can he control at once, how much authority does he have over it, and while we're at it, how do you recreate your body from nothing? Well, the path to answering all of these questions can actually be found in a book written by an old colleague of Dr. Osterman's, Professor Milton Glass, titled Dr. Manhattan, Superpowers and the Superpowers. In the introduction to his bestseller, Professor Glass recaps the events of Manhattan's creation. In an accident that was certainly unplanned and just as certainly unrepeatable, a young American man was completely disintegrated, at least in a physical sense. Despite the absence of a body, a form of electromagnetic pattern resembling consciousness survived, and was able to, in time, rebuild an approximation of the body it had lost. Now all of you psychologists, philosophers, and neuroscientists out there are probably wondering the same thing I did when first reading that. Uh, what? A form of electromagnetic pattern resembling consciousness? That can't be right. At present moment, in our understanding of the human mind, we don't really know what consciousness is. Despite the billions of dollars we've spent researching the subject, we haven't found a consciousness section of the brain. And we don't have any solid evidence that it's some sort of collective effort either. The truth is, none of us understand why we seem to be the only things in the universe definitively capable of acknowledging our own existence and having thoughts about it. So where does Professor Glass get off saying he found a form of electromagnetic pattern resembling consciousness after John's apparent death? Well, obviously I can't speak for the writer or the professor, but if you break that sentence down with neuroscience and philosophy in mind, I actually think it might be trying to say two things. One, after Dr. Osterman was destroyed, we detected a form of electromagnetic pattern in the area that resembled neural functions. It looked like something was thinking, despite there being no body present. Two, looking back on the situation, this pattern was likely generated by the disembodied consciousness of Dr. Osterman, and that consciousness is what eventually rebuilt his body. It's standard when studying neuroscience to approach your research from the assumption that everything the brain does can ultimately be traced back to another physical factor, even if we don't know what that factor is yet. Everything is material. Because that's how science works. It's the study of the natural, the physical. We have to assume the consciousness is something in the brain, caused by these patterns. But what if it isn't? What if your consciousness exists outside of the brain in some immaterial state untouched by science, and it influences the patterns? This is a concept called mind-body dualism that proposes your body isn't actually you. You are some force outside your body, tied down to it, manipulating it like a puppet. And somewhere at the very beginning of this chain of events that leads to you thinking and eventually moving is an immaterial push from the real you that gets it all started. And I believe that both I and Professor Milton Glass have determined that's what Dr. Manhattan is. It's the only way to explain him returning from total annihilation, 
there had to be a non-physical component to his existence. Some of you might find that a little crazy or hard to follow. After all, we know we can affect a person's personality, memories, and thoughts to some degree by just poking around in the brain. Shouldn't that prove consciousness is inside? Well, think of it like an old-school television set. If you found one of these things and had no idea what it was, so you took off the back and started messing around with the wires, you'd probably eventually notice you could alter the color, picture, and sound pretty drastically. In fact, if you had really precise measurements and tools, you could probably get it to display and voice whatever you wanted. So it might seem perfectly sensible to come to the conclusion that these pictures and sounds can be entirely explained by the components of the television set, but that's wrong. The TV is also receiving input from an invisible wave of energy being broadcast through the sky by a television station far away, and you'll never know about it because you have no way of interacting with either of those things. There are also some philosophical arguments in support of mind-body dualism. Take the fact that we all seem confident we endure over time. If you compare the current you to the you when you were a baby, there are almost no similarities. You look different, have different properties, and are made up of completely different atoms, but you still recognize that as you. Why? It could be because your memory or personality endures, but there's a problem with that. Theoretically, we can get rid of those things, but you'll still recognize you as you. In fact, we can even duplicate those things. If I cloned you and gave that clone an identical personality and memories, would you be okay with me shooting you because there are two yous now, so you'll be fine? Probably not. We seem to recognize that there's some you distinct from the body. But whether you believe in mind-body dualism or not, there is one thing we all seem to agree on. When you're dead, you are gone. If mind-body dualism is wrong, then no duh, your brain stopped functioning and that was you. You're dead. But if mind-body dualism is right, then death at the very least seems to destroy that connection your consciousness had with your body, either killing both of them or sending the consciousness off somewhere else. Dr. Manhattan comes from a universe where mind-body dualism was accidentally proven true by an experiment that annihilated his physical form. Somehow, in that test chamber, the energy they hit Dr. Osterman with, the conditions of the experiment, for the first time ever, allowed humanity to reach out and interfere with the immaterial connection between a man's mind and a man's body. And when Osterman was killed, his consciousness didn't disconnect like it was supposed to. It did the exact opposite. It connected to everything. Imagine for a moment that when you think, your thoughts are being kickstarted by your consciousness. It isn't doing much. Maybe it's collapsing a wave function or gently shifting a tiny subatomic particle. And it's restricted to your brain. Now imagine if it was freed. And it could move any particles it liked anywhere it wanted. Connected to everything, everywhere, unlimited control. This thing we call Dr. Manhattan isn't even really Dr. Manhattan. It's just a bunch of atoms and particles he pulled together to give you something to look at and talk to. Even if you found a way to catch him off guard and destroy it, he'd just put it back together again because the real him is a consciousness you can't see or touch. So where is he then? Well, my imaginary friends, not only do I think I know the answer, but I think it provides us the last bit of evidence we need to understand exactly how powerful Dr. Manhattan truly is. Because I'm almost positive that his true form is located in a higher spatial dimension. Now, I've talked about higher spatial dimensions before in a lot more detail than I have time to go into today, but to make a long story short, just because we experience reality in three dimensions doesn't mean there are only three dimensions out there. In fact, theoretical physics suggests there could be a lot more. And just as a tiny, two-dimensional flatlander would have no way of interacting with you because you're in a direction it can't comprehend, we would have no way of interacting with anything that existed in more than three spatial dimensions, making it the perfect place for an immaterial consciousness to exist. But if that isn't enough evidence to convince you that this is where the real Dr. Manhattan hangs out as he plays with our atoms the same way we play with drawings, I also did some looking into one of his most frequently used superpowers, teleportation. Now, there are a lot of ways for someone to teleport, theoretically, but I have a hunch that Dr. Manhattan is specifically warping the space around him to pull himself into and out of a higher dimension. How do I know that? Well, firstly, because Dr. Manhattan himself has said, I warp space around me so that I don't move, space moves. Which, honestly, could still mean a lot of things, but most of them are destructive, while simply warping into a higher dimension isn't. And neither is whatever warp Manhattan is using. 
And secondly, when Ozymandias, a character from the original Watchmen story, tried to recreate Dr. Manhattan's teleportation ability, he founded and funded two research organizations to get the job done. Dimensional Developments and the Institute for Extraspatial Studies. During his research period, he could even be found musing on the fact that Dr. Manhattan lives in all universes simultaneously, a feat only possible if he existed on a plane beyond them. So where does this leave us? Dr. Manhattan is the disembodied consciousness of Dr. Osterman, cut loose from his physical form by the intrinsic field subtractor, and left to wander the higher dimension all consciousness resides in, slowly learning more and more about what he is and what his powers are capable of. In DC, at least, having more dimensions than something else essentially makes you infinitely more powerful than it is. Just like we have infinite power over a sketch or a line. This is why fifth dimensional characters like Mixius Pitalik can destroy infinite universes without even trying. But even Mixius Pitalik has admitted that Dr. Manhattan is far more powerful than he is, apparently existing even higher up the ladder. So how powerful is Dr. Manhattan? Well, he's far more powerful than a thing that's infinitely more powerful than a thing that's infinitely more powerful than infinite power. At least. So this might all seem like it should have been a much simpler answer, but the kicker actually lies in the one dimension we haven't discussed yet. Time. You may have heard time described as the fourth dimension before, and while that's kind of true, it's also kind of not, because time is a temporal dimension. It doesn't necessarily exist immediately above the three spatial dimensions we're most familiar with, it's just the only other dimension 99% of us will ever talk about. At their core, dimensions might best be described as directions. And while, yes, it's possible there are tons of directions we don't know about and can't comprehend because physics, time itself is also, in many ways, a direction. If I'm going to meet with you at an office building, you not only need to know that building's latitude, longitude, and what floor I'm on, but you also need to know what time I'm going to be there. Existing in a space with four directions instead of three doesn't immediately make time irrelevant to the equation. It is, however, irrelevant to Dr. Manhattan. Somewhere among the flurry of other dimensions he resides in, Dr. Manhattan exists outside of time. He's said to experience every second in the universe simultaneously. He sees no difference between the past, present, and future, because to him, everything just is. And as a result, in his original story, he grew distant from humanity, unable to do anything. Consider what it must be like to exist outside of time where nothing happens because nothing can happen, and to watch the events of the universe play out, you included, in the same way they've always played out, in the same way they always will play out, like looking at a static picture forever. Because of your power. Is this power? But recently, Dr. Manhattan's been doing all kinds of things. Ever since arriving in the DC multiverse, he's stolen time, rewritten history, split Superman in half, reconstructed the cosmos, shattered the microverse, created new realities, he even fought a supervillain. And if I had to guess why, I'd say it's because in DC, people can change time. People can run through it, swim in it, jump in and out of it. Heck, the multiverse has been twisted and broken and retconned so many times, there are timelines about how timelines of other timelines have changed. DC has more than one temporal dimension. And Dr. Manhattan actually has something to do here because he doesn't transcend all of them. Trust me, I've seen what it looks like up there. And this limitation finally forced upon Dr. Manhattan by entering a bigger multiverse with bigger fish is what allows him to occasionally lose to people like Superman or The Flash. For the first time since he was Dr. Osterman, he's not sitting on the outside as the only person who can see and spin the gears of reality. The thing that proves Dr. Manhattan isn't all-powerful is the fact he's living. Knowledge is power. And ultimately, we may never know how all the complexities of our universe operate. From the tiny world of quantum mechanics, to the vast infinities of higher dimensions. From the mysteries of body and mind, to the unflinching truth of time. Is fate set in stone? Is there somebody else out there winding the wheels of reality for us? Honestly, things might get a little boring if we were the pinnacle of all creation. There wouldn't be any more questions left to answer. But we're not. He's not. And that's what makes this place worth exploring for the both of us. Perhaps some mysteries are best left unsolved. Well, slightly unsolved.
Hello Internet, yes, yet again reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. But to personally apologize for my extended health-related absence, I've prepared this extra-long 20-minute video for you guys, and I really hope you enjoyed it. Don't worry about it, I'm fine now, and you shouldn't have to worry about dealing with an absence this long again until something really big comes up, and I'll do a better job of keeping everybody informed next time. Speaking of which, you can stay informed by visiting my Facebook or Twitter page. And if you're new around here, hi, I promise videos don't usually take this long to make. And they usually aren't this long in general. But if you liked what you saw, then consider moving your atoms over to the mouse and clicking that subscribe button. Or, you know, share the channel with your friends. Every little bit helps. You aren't obligated to do anything, of course, but I'd like to sincerely thank you for watching to the end of the video, and have a fantastic day.